This is PRU1, right? Yeah, it's PRU1. I think we were just about Yeah, we are on that people. Oh, okay. We are going to Alright. So, Wasdam looks no. familiar. Okay, so, control panel. Um, does everyone remember this from lab? Right? You saw this in behind the window, right? Anyone have a chance to work with the control panel during clinic? Mm -hmm. right. sure. sure. The portable machine you have to do. Uh, the speed echo phone though, oh, make change oh, oh, That's what I have to say. The speed echo phone though. Make change though. Ah yes. Great. Anyone have to suddenly learn Spanish to deal with your patient? Mm -hmm. Me number. I need survival. I need enough. If you have not learned Spanish yet, Spanish. you will know Spanish by the end of these two years. Okay? <laughs> you, need, you need to learn the language of your patient, right? You can't always expect the patient Dude, to speak this, English. This right? was making you need to and like doing yeah. help the patient. No. Yeah. So at the very least, learn your basic phrases, right? Learn how to give breathing instructions in Spanish. Learn how to ask them to move in Spanish. Mm -hmm. you know, towards the left, towards the right. Stand, sit, right? Learn, right? learn basic phrases so that you can at least learn how to ask for pregnancy, right? Baby. Marazada, right? Marazada, right? Baby. So, directionals? <laughs> directionals are most, would you say directionals are most important? Would you say directionals are the most important? Like, uh, hey, move to the left, move to the right. Uh, the most adult. important would be breathing instructions. Okay. Right? Uh, move to the left, move to the right. You can uh, use charades to <laughs> tell them how to do things. Right? But breathing instructions, that's pretty important. Asking, identifying information. So, like, nombre, fecha de nacimiento. With the accent? Oh, okay. okay. He says, I shop only at Fiesta. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> <laughs> okay, ideally you know how to say X-ray as well, just so that we know why you're talking to that. Right? But yes, make sure that you learn at least some basic phrases so that we can try and speak to your patients. Um, second most common language outside of Spanish and English would be Vietnamese, actually, mm -hmm. in my experience. So you might want to learn how to give breathing instructions in Vietnamese. Okay, listen, how do you say it? Really? Uh, I, I think I'm going to be judged way too harshly. <laughs> uh, how do you say it? Yeah, you say it's okay, yeah. I'm only recording. Uh, it was so, what was it? Something like Tao and Nin Tao. Tao and Nin Tao. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. How do you say it? Tao. What does it mean? Hi. Tao. Tao. The Tao. Tao. Not the Tao. No. Bruh. What does it mean? Your name. Yeah. Oh. Tao. Oh, Tao. Your name. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna say, can you do my dance and move that slide? Girl. Oh, where's the slide? Just beyond me. I'm Chinese. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want to say my birthday. <laughs> You know little Wayne? I think I know. <laughs> yeah. I used to have a I used to have a classmate, um, a Hispanic classmate who spoke much better Vietnamese than I did because her boyfriend was Vietnamese and she learned so that she could speak to him with his family. That was very, very impressive. Yeah. That's dedication. She really wanted well, you know what? Hey, that, <laughs> hey, that game must be crazy. Like, without the phone, you know, you have hours. You have, like, a language. Like, I think that's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. I'll take it into consideration. I think that'd be pretty cool. She proposed to him. Yes. I agree. I mean, there's, like, a lot of Spanish-speaking people. I'm like, what they say? I was like, you don't want to know. I see, you're looking for an easy class for the Spanish speakers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's not going to be easy for everyone to speak it. Exactly. Okay. Well, sorry, let's move back to Pierre. <laughs> sorry, let's move back to Pierre. So, control panel lets you control many parameters here, right? So, KVP, this is going to be the energy of your x rays. How powerful are your x rays? 
how much stuff can be punched through. Right, the higher the KGP, the thicker the tissue they can get through. MA, AMs, milliseconds. Together, these form mass, milliamperage seconds. This is the number of x-rays we will produce. Right, so for a finger, we only need a few x-rays. For an abdomen, we're going to need a lot of x-rays. So mass would need to go up. That was MA? Mm -hmm. MA, MS, and MAS, all three work together. Okay. To find the number of x-rays. Number of x-rays. The anatomic program. So here, you can see femur, knee, tip, tip, foot, ankle, calcaneus, right? We can select which part we are dealing with. And the uh, console is programmed, so when we select a part, it gives us the average, like KVP and mass, or the average person's um, KVP and mass for that part. Right? And then from there, if you want to be a really awesome tech, you look at your patient, you're like, okay, are they actually average? Maybe they're a bit bigger, maybe a bit smaller. I can fiddle with these numbers a little bit more to optimize it to my patient. Right? But it gives you a good starting point. Uh, focal spot. This determines how sharp your image will be. So ideally, we want a sharp image, right? But if you make your focal spot too sharp, you might end up burning out your tube. So it's a balance between sharpness and heat. AEC, automatic exposure control, AKA the lazy text method of determining X-ray energies. So in this case, it helps you determine this for you on the fly. Basically, you shoot your X-ray, the Bucky is monitoring how many X-rays it is, it's receiving. Once it receives the proper number of X-rays, it stops your exposure, and so you don't need to actually set these. It will be done for you. And finally, the Bucky selection, right? Are you doing the wall stand, are you doing the table, or are you doing a free cassette? So you know how you guys had to make sure to manually select those during testo, right? You can do this from the control panel as well, right? Table, wall, free cassette. So if you were to, by definition, say Bucky selection is uh, you're selecting the IR or the uh, where the x-rays are going to go. Correct. And think of it also as like detector selection. Which detector are we going to use? That makes the decision. Oh, oh yes, that's right. Yes, you were involved in it. You saw the automatic, the yeah, robotics. I was using it. I thought that was so cool. Yes. So if you were imaging the calcaneus, or that's the heel, right? Correct. Um, you would have to use a high KVP. Mm. De depends on your definition of high. Well, I mean, like, uh, quote unquote, high. Because mm -hmm. the portable machine, if I'm not mistaken, it had like a little subsection that said high or like low. Or it's high compared to other extremities. Right. Yes. But not that high compared to like, like the abdomen or whatever. Because of the size. Correct. Yeah. What's that? Is that all you need? That's where you can pick like if your patient's kind of chunky or something? Um, the bottom? Yeah. Oh, body habitus? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you can choose body habitus and it also helps adjust. Would it only have like those two or would it have people that have Some machines have more. Some machines have like small, medium, large. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we still did in chapter one. Yes, this is still chapter one. The portable didn't have those buttons. It was just you had to manually adjust the numbers and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Depending on your machine, some of these may be here, some of these may not. All depends on the machine. Right? So that's why it's always so important that when, whenever you run into a new machine, you figure out exactly what buttons do what, what options you have, so you know how you can um, use the equipment to its fullest potential. We didn't see, we didn't shield a single patient yesterday. I hate to hear that, but yep. Yeah. I, I, I asked my text several times. Like, I was kind of nervous because, like, we were in the room while we were taking them, mm -hmm. and there was no shielding. Mm -hmm. So they didn't even let us know. Sometimes, like, hey, I'm about to take it. Let's follow me. They were just like, all right, and I heard the beat, run it. Oh. So I'm 
Yeah. Wait, where were you again? Ben's on. I was in Maine. I was with I was with Miss uh, Mr. Matthew and then Miss Fong. Miss Fong acts quick. Sometimes if you're not like reading her mind, she's not gonna tell you. All right. So yes. Um, I have that. All right. So your text should not be zapping you, but some what sometimes will do is if they feel like you've been in the room for too long. So do you remember how I told you that the switch has two levels that you can push down, right? Mm -hmm. Has anyone um, used the switch to shoot x-rays already? Has anyone tried the, using the two different levels? Or has anyone noticed the two different no, levels? No, I right. So when you go back to clinic um, on Tuesday, and you're in a normal x-ray room, or you're using a portable machine, okay, OR, this doesn't work. But when you have the button, try pushing the button only down halfway. And you will hear that the tube energizes. It goes mm -hmm. Right? It charges up, but it will not beep. Push it down the rest of the way, and then you hear beep or whatever noise it makes, right? Ding, right? Um, so some techs, when they feel like you're standing in the room too long, they will get on the rotor. They will start charging up the machine and go bzzz. And that's your sign to get the heck out of there because you're wasting too much time, right? It's good enough as is. Just get out, shoot it, and then go back in and position the next thing. Um, but no, tech should not be actually finishing off the exposure while you're in there. If they are, um, I'll have to talk to them. So just come talk to me after class and let me know who those techs are, okay? We do want you to be safe in there, so we do not want them exposing while you are in the room. Now, as far as patients go, if the tech is doing the exam, and the tech chooses not to show the patient. Whose responsibility is that? The yes. Theirs. If you are the one positioning the patient and there is no shield on the patient, whose responsibility is it? Us. Ours. Okay, good. So if you're the one doing the patient, shield your patient. Okay? If it's the tech doing it, all right, whatever. That's them. But I want you all to practice good Alara. I want you all to practice good techniques in clinic, which means shielding all your patients in clinic, unless you're not supposed to. Now, if your tech tells you, do not shield, then what do you do? You don't shield, right? If the tech is asking you to do something, just go with what the tech asks you to do, because at that point, they are responsible. In the end, they're responsible for everything anyway. But shield whenever you can. Okay, shield whenever you can. All right, speaking of which, one of the ways to practice Amara is shielding. Good, but what else do we have? Good, time and distance, right? So if I ever ask you, what are the three parts to radiation protection? What are the three parts to Amara? Time, distance, shielding. Time, distance, shielding. Great. So time, how long you are exposed to the ionizing radiation. Remember, the X-ray tube is not naturally radioactive, right? It only shoots off radiation when that button is held down all the way, and only for as long as the console is programmed for. So time, how long you're exposed to it, how long the exposure lasts, usually they last less than half a second nowadays, right? Gone are the 20 to 30 minute exposure times of Rimkin. The number of times the patient is exposed. Okay, so how many x-rays are we shooting? And then the length of time spent in fluoro or with a CR. So yes, this is why surgery or IR or fluoroscopy, they are considered to be high dose environments because the X-ray is on for a much longer period of time. Chest X-ray, two shots, half a second each. How long is the exposure in total? One minute. One second, right? But in floral, we have something called a floral timer, which goes off at five minutes. Why? Because sometimes cases take a while, and it warns you that you have done over five minutes of active X-ray. Five minutes of active x-rays, that's 300 seconds, right? 
300 times longer than a tubule chest X-ray. So, floral sea arm, those are going to be more high dosage because the time is much longer. Distance, this is the space between an individual and the source of the radiation. So, for example, let's just pretend that instead of Shaheen sitting here, this is an X-ray tube, okay? So, if I'm standing right here next to the X-ray tube, am I gonna have more dose? Or if I'm standing over here, am I going to have more dose? No, the closer I am, the more higher the dose, right? We did talk about this in intro to rad tech as well. So, once again, inverse square law. Now, which number is on top, which number is on bottom? Honestly, does not matter. As long as, on the other side, they are reversed. So the one's on top here, the two's on top. If the two is on bottom, then the one's on the bottom, right? They're opposite, that's why it's inverse, right? Don't do one, one, and two, two, because that will give you the wrong answers. If it's one on top, then it's two on top on the opposite side. Inverse. What is that? Okay. So, I one is the intensity, the original intensity. How much X-ray? How much dose I was originally getting. I two is the new intensity. So I changed my distance. How much dose am I getting now? D two squared. So my new distance, and then we have to square the distance, multiply it by itself. D one, my original distance squared the original distance multiplied by itself. Okay, so if my old distance was 40, and my new distance is 72, 72 would go here, because it's the new one, so D2. And then 72 times 72, that's what the square is for. Now here, original is 40, so 40 times 40. Can you give us an example of this? Sure, we will get into examples in just a moment. Okay, and finally, the last part, shielding. Like normally, we've got our little lead shield here, or something that is lead equivalent. Lead equivalent means it's not fully made of lead, but it has the same protective properties as lead. Okay. So the reason why we use lead equivalent instead of lead now, cheaper. cheaper um, Less perhaps. Um, yeah, my back was really nice. yesterday because I'm not sure. But yes, less heavy. Usually lead equivalent materials are lighter than lead is. Lead is a really heavy element. So yes, um, me personally, whenever I was in OR, I did not like wearing the forward aprons that, because <coughs> they hang on the shoulder, it hurts the back. That's you. I like using the two-piece. It's like a vest and a skirt. Like, yeah, so one, it goes all the way around, which is really nice. And two, it kind of distributes the weight better, right? Half the weight on my shoulders, half the weight on my hips instead. Yes, that thing is heavy. And then you have to walk around with that for three hours while you're yeah. and in the case. Hot too. And it's hot, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Even though they call it cool the room down, it still is very hot. Okay, speaking of shielding, not only do we shield individual people, but we have shielding for the room as well. So shielding in the room falls into two categories, primary and secondary. So I want you to just imagine the lab room right now. Think about where the x-ray tube was when you were saying exposed, when you're saying x-ray during your test outs. Where was that tube pointing? Away from wall. Okay, it was pointing towards which wall? Wall. The wall bucket. The wall bucket. Okay. Where else was it pointing? The table. The table. Did we point it anywhere else? The patient. Okay. Well, well, in, in the wall. In relation to the room, though. Oh, the well, wall. The cassette. Wall. Ceiling wall. The, the Did we ever point the cassette. tube at the ceiling when we? Sh Said X ray? No. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, did we put it at any other walls when we said X ray? Uh, on, on the left. 
Okay, yeah, the, the law on the side, right, when we did our D cubes. Yes, sir. Right. Did we ever point the x-ray tube towards the window when we said x-ray? No. Mm -hmm. Towards the sink? No. no. So, primary barriers are located in areas that the x-ray beam is often directed towards. So, behind the law bucky, under the table, next to the table if you would do a D cube. That is where we have our primary barriers located. So, primary barriers are 1 16th inch lead equivalent. So in those walls, you have a material that, is, that has the protective value of 1 16th of an inch of lead. Why? Because it's thicker to prevent x-rays from leaving the room, right? Because think about it, what's, be, uh, what's behind the wall bucky's wall? The hallway. The hallway, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to be shooting x-rays and exposing people in the hallway, so that's why we have the primary barrier. Now, places that we don't normally aim the x-ray to, right? Like the ceiling, or the window, where the control panel is. Those are secondary barriers. Because we're not aiming the x-ray tube here, they don't need to be as thin. So instead of 1 over 16, this is 1 over 32. Right? It's half as thick. You don't need as much lead in the secondary barrier. Yes? So where would the floor fit in? Because like yesterday, they were doing a lot of like sun rays. Mm -hmm. So they were, the beam was aiming towards the floor. I mean, there was a cassette that it was aimed towards the floor. So which one would the floor fall under? Yep, so floor is primary. <laughs> okay. It's been a long, long time. He waited until Tuesday. There's a whole question. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. All right, so primary, places that we're likely to aim the x-ray tube at. Secondary, places we're probably not going to aim the x-ray tube at. Right? Different thicknesses of protection. If you go to your clinic and you check the room, there should be a sign somewhere stating how thick the lead is in that area. Right? I know that in LBJ outpatient, there's even a sign, I'm pretty sure there's a sign on the window as well, stating how protective the window is. Right? So go around, look for that, pay attention to it. Right? Relate that back to what we are learning right now. Okay. This stuff does show up in your clinic. Now, um, I did send this out to you all on the group me, if I remember correctly. NCRP, um, last year, put out a statement that recommends against routine gonadal shielding for abdominal and pelvic exams. Right. And they listed out their reasons. They said, it, Shielding interferes with AEC, it adds scatter, it causes people to repeat x-rays. And based on our understanding of radio sensitivity now, the risks aren't as great as we originally assumed. Okay. So that's why they say we are no longer required, or we actually recommend against shielding abdominal and pelvic exams. Chest x-rays, they didn't say anything about that, so Keep shielding your chests. And if you ever want to look it up, it's right there or inside uh, the group chat. Yes, Raven. What is the, like, what's the, like, what can happen? Like, what, what are they trying to prevent? Like, shielding, what, like, what can happen? Okay, so what are the possible effects of radiation? So, there are two major categories random and non random. Okay. I'm going to use those common terms for now. Later on, you'll learn the fancy terms for them, which is uh, stochastic and tissue effects. But you have random and non-random. Non-random effects only occur when you reach a certain dose level. In X-ray, you will almost never come remotely close to ever possibly getting to the place where you can see those dose levels, right? Those dose levels are so high that you should not see them in X-ray. We're talking about two, something like two grams, when x-rays are 0 0.01 milligrams, right? So, 
if you reach that level of radiation, then you start seeing things like radiation burns, um, loss of red blood cells, loss of white blood cells, um, digestive issues, bleeding, um, seizures, things like that. Eventually, death. But that's not what we're concerned about because we won't reach those levels in X-ray. So why are we shielding? We're shielding to prevent random effects. What kind of random effects are there? Most common one, or most obvious one, is cancer. Cancer is caused when a cell grows out of control, right? Why? Because there was a change to the cell's DNA. What can cause changes to DNA? Radiation. So we want to limit the chance of that happening. The chance might be one in a billion, but you're shooting off so many photons that you know there's always going to be that chance, that risk. Other things, um, things like um, cataracts are, I believe, are random. And then things like genetic defects. So not dealing with yourself, but dealing with future generations, right, your children. Radiation can affect the sperm or the eggs. It can affect the DNA inside those, so that when the sperm and egg come together to form a child, that genetic defect gets carried over to the child. Right? So it doesn't affect the parent, but affects the child. So it could lead to things like mutations, birth defects, um, let's see, like um, stillbirth, or any number of genetic diseases. Correct. So, new understanding of radio sensitivity is that the radiation dose that we give um, doesn't actually increase the risk of cancer by that much, even without shielding. So, that's why they're saying that it's okay now. But of course, if you want to minimize the chance to the maximum possible, you do shielding, even if you drop the chance by another 5% or 10%, right? Maybe that'll save someone. So. Yes, Melanie. So how come we don't, how come we don't have like suits where we um, give them like a whole body shield instead of just like, like the one that looks like me? So do you as a tech need full body shielding? If you're in OR? of every single thing, right? I'd be scared of walking outdoors because a meteor could fall on my head. But I also should be worried about staying indoors because the building might collapse on me. So it's like, oh, what do I do now? Right, so we can't, we can't be scared of everything. You just need to do risk assessment. How likely is this to be a danger? We're not gonna pay for it anyway. <laughs> okay. uh, beam restriction, collimation, very important, right? Lower the area of X-ray exposure, lower the total dose to the patient. Okay. Collimation needs to be done at the tube. When you were in clinic, did anyone see the text go over to the computer and like cut out a portion of the image to send across to the doctors? Yes. She was That's all the time doing All the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yes. So that is called post-collimation. That's called cropping. But That's called masking. Also, but I don't know when she was, she's coming back, she's all the time doing it. Yes. So, sometimes they do that because when you shoot the x-ray, there's this kind of like fuzzy white edge on the image, and they just don't want to flash bang the radiologist with that bright white. So they cut off the white so it's just nice and dark for the radiologist. But some people do it because they just suck at collimating, and they want to make the image look nice for the radiologist. But if you are post-collimating, did you actually reduce the size of your x-ray beam? No. 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 So did the patient get the full dose? Yes. Yes. So does this help them at all? No. No. So post-collimation is not a, an effective replacement for actual real collimation. Do not go and shoot a finger with a 14 by 17 collimation and then later cut it down on the computer to the size of the finger. 
because that does nothing for the patient. Okay? In addition, if you collimate properly, you actually make your image look better. For example, I've got two spines here. Which one can you see more clearly? More focused on the A. A, the one on the left here. Why? Because, do you see this? We've collimated out all uh, the stuff. By collimating in, we focus the x-rays in here, we reduce our scatter, we reduce the number of x-rays that are bouncing in the wrong directions, and so we get a more clear image, a sharper image. It looks less foggy, it looks less blurry. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The collimation actually improves your image. So, two good reasons why you should collimate now. Is that the lumbar spine? Yes, this is the lumbar spine. Very good. Okay, finally, let's talk a little bit more about those exposure factors. KVP stands for kilo voltage peak. Okay, what is voltage? Electricity. Power. Pressure. Right, measures electricity, measures the potential of that electricity. Kilo. What is kilo? Weight. Measurement. Measurement. Weight. Measurement of mass. Measurement. So, we have a meter, we have a kilometer. We have a gram, we have thousand. a kilogram. Kilo is thousand. Sir. Yes, kilo is 1,000. So, kilo voltage means? 1,000. 1,000 volts, right? We're dealing with thousands of volts in x-ray, right? And then peak, what is a peak? The max, the top, right? So, KVP, we are setting the maximum power that our x-rays will be produced at. Okay, so we'll produce x-rays from this energy level on down, right? Everything from here and below. This controls quality. Make sure you remember this. Make sure you remember this. Make sure you remember this. Quality is associated with KVP. If you see quality, the first word that should come out of your mouth afterwards is KVP. Okay, quality. KVP, quality, KVP, quality, KVP. Quality deals with penetrating power. How much energy does that x-ray have? How much stuff can it go through? Okay? If photons have low energy, they will not be able to pass all the way through the patient. They'll get stuck somewhere in the middle. They'll get absorbed. If the photons have high energy, they will have enough power to get all the way through the patient and to your receptor. Okay. Any photons that are absorbed increases the patient dose. Right? Photons absorbed increases patient dose. And then we have something here called the 15% rule. So let's say you shoot an x-ray. The x-ray looks good, the brightness looks good, right? Black, white, I can see all the colors I like. But, I want to change the KVP and the max. Okay? Maybe I want to reduce the dose to the patient. So, I want to reduce my mass, and to compensate, I'm gonna increase my KVP. So that way the image stays the same brightness, but I'm using fewer x-rays. A 15% rule means that KVP goes up by 15%, mass goes down by 15%, five zero. It goes down by half. 15% one way, 50% the other. So nice way to reduce your mass. Speaking of which, let's talk about mass. Mass stands for milliampere seconds. Anyone happen to remember what an ampere is from physics? Measurement of current. Measurement of current. Current what? Current events? Current yeah. politics? Electric, electric current. Electric current. Okay. Electric current. What? What is an electric current? Mm. Well, it's just the flow of electricity. How many electrons or how many charges are flowing through a point? Milli, 
Milli, what is Milli? Milli, Milli P? One by thousand. Milli gram, millimeter, one, one over thousand. Okay. Inverse of a thousand. Right? So it's like the opposite of kilo, right? Mm -hmm. It's one over one thousand. One thousandth of something. A thousand times smaller. So very small current. And then seconds. Is this per second? No, it's one, it's one milli of the second. So is this milli amperes per second? Yes. Is this per second? Is this like miles per hour? No. How do you write? No, 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 sir. This is uh, the quantity, like you divide the second by into a thousandth of a second. So mm. are you dividing? By a thousand. One thousandth of a second. Mm. Do you see a division sign in here? The milli ampere, right? So because we have multiple thousand. It's um, milli. The milli. So, ampere it's time. Time. It's so yes, the ampere is small, right? The ampere is divided by one thousand. But is the seconds being divided by anything? No. 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 It's being multiplied by the milli amperes, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not like your miles per hour. You're not taking your energy, your current and dividing by seconds. Instead, you are multiplying by seconds, milliampere seconds. So the current times the time you are exposing. You take these together, and these give you your quantity. Quantity, quantity, quantity. Know this one, remember this, quantity, very important. If I say quantity, your first response should be mass. If I say quality, your first response is? KGP. Quantity. Yes. Mass. Quality. KGP. Quantity. Mass. Quantity. Yes. Quantity is mass. Quantity is mass. mass. Quality. KGP. Quantity. Mass. Quality. KVP. Quality. KVP. Quality. KVP. Quantity. Mass. Quality. <laughs> All right, good. I think we have this. So, quality is KVP, quantity is mass. The number of x rays, the number of photons we produce. Okay, so energy versus number. Okay, so I know this is a kind of a weird analogy because we live in Texas, but just imagine that you're you're a kid and you want to have a snowball fight with someone, right? Right? And so I right, once again I know it's Texas. This might not be just think of your move just think of some movies where they have snowball, right? Okay. <laughs> so you're a kid, right? You pack up your snowball and you go, you <laughs> Is that snowball gonna go very far? No. Is it gonna do very much damage? No. Are you gonna knock your friend over with that? No, no right? So low energy, right? Low KVP. You take that snowball and you're like, bam, right? Like you're trying off for the Astros pitcher position. <laughs> High energy, right? Is that going to have a lot of penetrating power? <laughs> yes. How many snowballs is that? A lot. A lot. Right. You only threw one snowball. One big one. One, right, one fast one, right? Mm -hmm. One strong one. Yes. One strong snowball, but still, just one snowball. So KVP is all about power, right? Weak snowball, strong snowball. Mass, mass is about oh, numbers. Maybe mass is how you picking up a whole bunch of snowballs and going, cha, right? Yeah. And you just toss 20 snowballs at your friend. Dodge this, right? Yeah. They would have less energy. So you can take those 20 snowballs and go, like, right? So it can be low energy, but a lot. Or you can take them and be like, cha, a lot of snowballs, a lot of energy, right? So the energy can be different. The number can be different. You can have low numbers, high energy, low numbers, low energy, high numbers, high energy, high numbers, low energy, right? You can mix and match them in all different ways. And depending on what anatomy you're looking at, you may want one type instead of the other. Now, because we're dealing with number of photons with mass, the more x-rays there are, what do you think happens to the dose? Increases. It increases, right? More x-rays, more dose. Makes sense, right? Pretty straightforward. So mass 
controls patient dose. Mass is primarily responsible for patient dose. If you want to reduce patient dose, one of the things you should look at reducing is the mass. So Drop down your mass and then raise your KVP instead. That's the 15% rule? And that's how we come back to the 15% rule. Wait. So you yes. said if it goes up 15%, it cuts down the mass by 50%? Correct, by half. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, let's use some easy numbers. Let's say the KVP is 100 and the mass is 10. All right, 10 mass. Eh, I don't know. That feels, that feels like a lot of dose. What if I take that mass and instead of 10, I make it 5 mass? Half the mass, half the dose. What do I need to do with my KVP to keep the image looking about the same? 115. Great, right, increased by 15%. So now it goes from 100 to 115. So 115 KVP, 5 mass, is about the same as 100 KVP, 10 mass. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Image looks about the same, but our dose has significantly decreased. Can you explain? Please give me that. All right, so let's go. This is, okay, hold on. Let me do the last slide and then we'll come back to this. Okay. I have a question though yes. about that slide. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, can you clarify on bullet points two and, I'm sorry, three and four on the KVP board? Three and four. Mm -hmm. Okay, if photons have low energy, they're gonna have a tough time penetrating the patient. Mm -hmm. Photons absorbed will increase dose. So, KVP is about energy, it's about penetrating power. Mm -hmm. So if you've got something thin, you can use lower energies and the photon will be able to go through it. If you have something thick, the photon is gonna travel, but it's gonna get stuck halfway. Right? It's gonna disappear, it's gonna get absorbed in the tissue here. When it gets absorbed, this is contributing to patient dose. So by raising our KVP, we are reducing absorption by being a, pushing those photons through. So because it has low energy, mm -hmm. right? It's gonna be, it's not gonna penetrate. And then it, it, it increases the dose, but if it has high energy, mm -hmm. it decreases the dose. Correct. Okay. So yes, actually increasing the KVP will help decrease the dose in multiple ways. Yes? So if the individual that we're shooting has uh, clothing that would, like let's say they're wearing a hoodie or something like that, would we have to increase the KVP if they refuse to take it off or whatever? Uh, yes, that could be a consideration because okay. you're adding thickness to the patient mm -hmm. like that. Oh, sorry, okay. Final bullet point here. Digital imaging can correct the brightness of an image, making it easy to overexpose the patient. What does that mean? Well, it means that you are living in a very fortunate, very lucky era in terms of being an X-ray tech. Back in the day, all right, back in the day, <laughs> X-ray techs had to know precise KVP and mass measurements for every single body part in every single body habitus. In fact, they had to be so precise, they would pull out calipers. Do you remember calipers from lab? Uh -huh. Right, those little ruler looking things, right, like that. They would pull out basically rulers to measure the thickness of body parts so they could figure out what KVP and what mass they were supposed to use. The reason is because if they used the wrong KVP and mass settings on a body part, on a certain thickness of tissue, when they printed out, when they got the picture out on the film, right, because we used physical film back then, it would either be too dark or too light. And since it's a film, you can't change it. You're stuck with what you got. So then the doctor would complain, they say, I can't see anything on this, it's too dark, it's too bright. You need to shoot this again with the correct settings. Fast forward to today, our pictures are digital. And the great thing about digital is you can Photoshop your pictures, right? So you can go in and you can change the brightness. You can change the blacks and the whites and the grays. You can change the picture so that you can see things more clearly. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. And 
So the machines are actually designed to expect images to look a certain way. If they don't look that way, the machine will automatically change your picture to fit what it's looking for. If you shoot your picture and it's too dark, it will automatically lighten up your picture to look perfect. If your picture's too light, it will automatically darken your picture to look perfect. So you have a much um, easier time in terms of energy. So you have much more flexibility in the KVP and the math that we use. You can use a much wider range and still get a perfect looking picture because the computer will adjust for you. But the problem is, you no longer know if you are using more radiation than necessary. So you overexpose the patient, you shoot it too dark, the machine's like, ah, that's fine. Here, I made it light for you. Looks perfect, great job. And now you're, gonna, you're overexposing all your patients because you think this is the correct energy level. Right? So it becomes a lot easier to overexpose patients because of this. So something to watch out for. All right, finally, workflow tasks. Advocate for the patient so that you avoid duplicate exams. Patient came in two days ago, they already had a chest x-ray. Why are they getting another chest x-ray? Right? Make sure that you, the doctor is aware that there was a chest x-ray done already. Make sure they actually need this new one. Right? Screen for pregnancy, okay? 10 days after onset of menstruation. Okay. If the patient is pregnant, shield and collimate if it is a body part not in the abdominal area. If it isn't the abdominal area, check to make sure that the doctor actually needs this x-ray. Get documentation. And finally, get things right the first time. Give yourself enough time. Make sure you concentrate on your task. Don't be thinking about what you're gonna cook for dinner. And then just, you know, just autopilot your way through. Because you want to make sure that you're doing things right, so you don't need to repeat x-rays, so you don't need to re-expose your patient. Getting it done right the first time is better than having to come back and fix mistakes, even if it means adding a minute or two to your exam. And develop a mental checklist. Having a checklist makes it a lot easier to avoid missing something. Hey, did I line up my blue? Did I line up my green? Am I at 40 inch SID? Did I line up to my part? Did I call me? Did I put my marker, right? Have a checklist so that you won't forget to line up your tube and your bucky. Right? All right. And so that pretty much finishes off chapter one. So I do have something else I want to go over with you right now.